I like facts. I like for things to be very carefully delineated. I like for things to be very clearly laid out. And the subject that I wish to bring to you is one of the most serious subjects in the world. It is the reality of hell. I hear a great deal about the nonsense. People say there is no hell, or if there is a hell, it is a state of mind, or I even hear people who live very miserable lives here on this earth say that hell is here on earth. But that is not true. What I share with you comes directly from Scripture. What I share with you is what Jesus Christ says about hell. What I share with you is what John, in writing the Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says about hell. It is what Luke says about hell. What I share with you is the reality of Scripture that tells us truly of the reality of this place called hell. I wish there were no place called hell. I wish that hell did not have to exist. Indeed, the fact of the matter, the truth of the matter is that hell was not created for human beings. Hell was created for Satan and for the one-third of all of the angels that fell some time in history past. We do not know how many angels there were that fell. We only know by the scriptures that one-third of the, all the angels fell. They chose to follow Satan rather than to stay with God. They chose to follow Lucifer, an angel of light, rather than to follow God Almighty, who is the Lord of light. And so hell was created for them. But then man fell. Adam sinned. Adam created a debt of holiness to God that he could not pay, that only God could pay. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to deliver us from this real place called hell. Now you must understand something. An ounce of God's word is worth a hundredweight ton of man's opinion. Now, perhaps there are those listening to my voice and who would see me and you would say, Well, Dr. Torrey, you preach about hell all you like because I'm not going there. My fire escape is made. I am a believer in Jesus Christ and I don't have to worry about hell any longer. That is true. You do not. But if you do not concern yourself with hell for others, then you have missed what Jesus Christ wishes for us to have in love and compassion for those who are on their way to hell. Hell is a very real place. Let me read to you what Jesus Christ says about hell. I will be quoting a great many scriptures. Follow with me if you can. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. In verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. In this story, the sheep are those who believe in Jesus Christ. The goats are those who do not. Then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, and saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now, he is not preaching a, a way to earn our salvation. He is telling us that those who believe in Jesus Christ should be involved in helping the poor, and the sick, and the needy. And that that is as much an outgrowth of our belief, our Christianity, as going to church. But now let us read further. 
Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me no meat, food. I was a st and no water. I was a stranger, and he took me not in. Naked, and he clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and he visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to the one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. There is a real place called hell. Those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior are going to go there. And hell is a place of pain. Hell is a place of destruction. It is a place of torment. The scripture tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 29, he says to this crowd of people seated around him, And if thy right eye offend thee, cause, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. What Jesus Christ is trying to tell us here is that it would be better to suffer the loss of a hand or an eye than to go to hell. Oh, so often I hear people, they're very foolish. They say, well, Dr. Torrey, I, I can stand great pain. Not this type of pain. This is the pain that is beyond human suffering. It is the pain of destruction. Scripture calls hell a place of perdition. The word in the Greek there is the word for destruction. It is almost as if something were eating away at your body and every bite that it took of you was an intense pain except that this pain will never end. And so I wish for you to understand that hell is real, but hell is also a place of destruction. Hell is a place of great pain. Oh, but again, I hear them. I hear these foolish people. Why, Dr. Torrey, I, I can stand a lot of pain. Hell is also a place of painful memory. Hell is also a place of painful memory. In the book of Luke, we have what I think is a first-hand account of this place called hell. When I was studying for the law, we learned a great deal about first-hand accounts. We learned a great deal about what was said by eyewitnesses. And I believe we have here in the book of Luke a first-hand account of a person who went to hell. In Luke chapter 16, we read these words. And there was a certain rich man, which in verse 19, Luke 16 and verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, a name for heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell. The word there is Hades or Gehenna, a place of burning. In the New Testament, there was a valley of Hinnon. It was a place where everyone brought their refuse, and the, it was burned. It was always a place of burning and destruction. And it was a picture there, and when Jesus Christ mentioned that, those people knew exactly what they were envisioning. They were seeing this valley of Hinnon. They were seeing this valley of burning, this Hades, this Gehenna, this place of burning. And that is exactly what he wishes for us to see as he talks about this place called hell. And in hell, in Hades, in Gehenna, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. He was in pain. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember. Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, for now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You see, there in hell, he carried with him his 
memory. And I believe that individual who finds themselves in hell, they will remember this sermon for all eternity. They will remember every opportunity they had to come to Jesus Christ. And I believe that individual who would find themselves in hell, they will remember every opportunity they had to come to Jesus Christ and turned away. They will remember the lives that they ruined. And as they look back for all eternity, they will see step by step, choice by choice, every choice they made, even choices that appeared to be good, but led them away from God himself, led him away from Jesus Christ himself, led them step by step by step. And they will examine this for all eternity down to this place called hell. So there in hell, it is not only a place of pain, it is not only a place of suffering, but it is not only a place of painful memory, but it is also a place of desire forever denied. You say, I believe we will carry our desires with us into hell. That individual who would go to hell, that individual who rejects Jesus Christ. You see in this eyewitness account, let me read it to you again. In verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see, there in hell, this rich man was thirsty. While he walked this earth, he had the finest of wines and the best of foods, and apparently he gave himself to the pleasure of eating and drinking. But there in hell, there in torment, he was thirsty. He was so thirsty that even a drop of water upon his tongue would have been some modicum of relief. And I believe that individual who finds themselves in hell will want and want and want with a desire that can never be assuaged, with a desire that will always be denied. If you've given yourself to the accumulation of wealth, I do not know. Perhaps gold coins will fall for all eternity through your hands, always reaching, never able to grasp them. If you've given yourself to alcohol or to opium, to drugs, you will want and want and want with a burning desire for that to be assuaged and it will never be quenched. If you've given yourself to lust, you will want and want and want with a desire that can never be consummated. I do not know what the sin might be, but that thing that here upon this earth you have made your God, that thing that you have worshipped above and beyond Jesus Christ, who is the only one who is desire, us, desiring of our worship and deserves our worship. If you have given yourself to whatever that thing is that you yourself have worshipped here upon this earth, you will want it and want it and want it with a lust, with a desire that can never be quenched, never be be assuaged, never be met. And heaven, uh, hell is a place of desire forever denied. It is a place of pain. It is a place of suffering. It is a place of painful memory. It is a place of desire forever denied. But hell is also a place of vile companionships. Oh, how often have I heard these foolish words. Well, Dr. Torrey, I'm going to go to hell after all. All my friends will be there. As if hell was going to be some gigantic orgy of pleasure. Let, let me read to you what these friends are going to be in hell. Let me read to you this list, if you will, that John gives us about hell. We have in the book of the Revelation, the last inspired book of the Scripture, we have here in the book of the Revelation, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8. Here is a list of those who will be in hell. But the fearful, those are the cowards, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, those who have, who have committed the most heinous, perverted sins known to man, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, those who have worshipped the black arts, and idolaters, those who have set anything above Jesus Christ, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Are these the friends? Are these the people with whom you plan to spend eternity? Cowards? People whose lives have been given over to lust? People who have worshipped Satan? Are these the friends? And so it is. 
every individual that goes to hell steps over the crucified, buried, and resurrected body of Jesus Christ. You have trampled on His grace. You have trampled on His mercy. You have stepped over every roadblock that He has put in your path. The roadblock of prayer, the roadblock of the Holy Spirit, the roadblock of the Scripture, the roadblock of Jesus Christ Himself. And you have chosen to go to this place called hell. Luke 16, okay, and uh, here's what Jesus has to say. Is there really a horrible place of torment and suffering? Is there a literal hell? Well, here's what he says there. Okay, verse 19, okay. Here's what Jesus says. He said, now there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate laid this beggar named who? Lazarus. And this guy was covered with sores. And he, he was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Listen, even the dogs, the dogs came and licked the sword. And then the time came though when the beggar died and the angels carried him to where? Abraham's side. That's what we saw. The good side of Sheol. Okay, that's no longer there. Okay. The rich man also died and was buried and in where? Hell where he was what? Partying? No. He was in torment. And so he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called him. He says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because this is such an awesome place. Woo! I'm in agony, man, in this fire. But Abraham replied, hey, listen, son, remember, that's a freaky word. What did Jesus say to the guy that was in hell? Remember. You will remember every opportunity you had to escape this place as a free gift from God, but you said, no. No wonder it's described as a place of weeping and nursing of teeth. Why? He says this, he says, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here and you're in what? Agony. As we saw before, he says, besides all this, between us and you, there's this great chasm that's been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answers, listen to this. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus where? To my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not be, uh, also come to this place of torment. Isn't it interesting? We're going to see this in a little bit, Lord willing. That half the American church rejects the existence of hell. But the people in hell are begging people still alive on earth. Would you warn my loved ones? Isn't that wild? Wow. And that's what he says. He says, don't, don't please. And Abraham replied, hey, listen, they got Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In other words, they got the Bible, if you will. And he says, no, no, Father Abraham. He said, but if somebody uh, from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And listen to what he said. He said to him, he says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, listen, come on. They will not be convicted even if somebody rises from the dead. Wow, is that true or what? Right? No matter what you say, man, you can quote Bible till you're blue in the face. No, there ain't no hell. It's the same thing today, folks. According to our Bible, folks, the Bible clearly teaches that, listen, a place of eternal torment and suffering really exists. And again, I'll say this again. Keep in mind, who's the one who's teaching this? Jesus. See, we all want to pick and choose with the scripture, unfortunately. Okay? If it, we all like that golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. If we love one another, we'll keep his commandments. They'll know that you're my disciples when we love one another. Oh, we love those. But Jesus right here says, guess what? Hell is real. You can't sit there and pick the parts that you like to hear from Jesus and then reject this. It's called hypocrisy. Okay? In fact, folks, this is wild. If you look at the Gospels... Mark, Luke, and John there, you're going to see that Jesus spoke, listen, more about eternal punishment in hell than he ever did about heaven. And the words that he used were extremely graphic. One of them was a, a, a word called Gehenna. Now, now, you and I don't get that, so let me elaborate on that, but the people of Jesus' day, when he talked about it, got it. Here's what Gehenna was. Listen to this. The word hell translates from Gehenna, which means the valley of Hinnom, and it was the valley that was west and south of Jerusalem that, listen, the Canaanites worshipped Baal and the god Molech by sacrificing their children in a fire that burned constantly. 
Can you believe that? They chucked their kids alive into the fire of this hot piping idol just for the sake of personal well-being and convenience. We don't do that today, do we? We don't murder children for the sake of personal well-being. Well, let's continue on. And then at the time of Jesus, the Valley of Hinnom was also used as a garbage dump of Jerusalem. Into it were thrown all the filth and the garbage of the city, including the dead bodies of animals and executed criminals. They all just got chucked in there. Now listen, to consume all this, the fires burned constantly. Maggots worked in through the filth, and at night, wild dogs howled as they were fighting over the garbage. And it was this awful scene that Jesus pointed to when he was describing hell. And he said, in fact, he says, do you, do you want to know what hell is like? He said, look at Gehenna. It's God's cosmic garbage dump. All that is unfit for heaven will be thrown into that place, a place called hell. Jesus said that. Very, very graphic, okay? Describing hell, okay? And again, folks, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Jesus and other passages of the Bible are replete. This place is horrible. You don't want to go there. Let's take a look at just a, a couple of those passages that I saw. Uh, it's called a place of thirst. Luke 16, we just read that. A place of worms, Mark chapter 9. It's a place of no return. You ain't getting out, Luke 16. It's a place of remembrance. You're going to remember. We just saw that, Luke 16. A place of the wicked dead, Luke 10. Uh, it's a place of the wicked demons, Second Peter chapter 2. A place of the bottom pit, Luke chapter 8. It's a place of the burning waste dump. That's your Gehenna, Matthew 23. It's a place of outer darkness, Matthew 8. It's a place of fire, Revelation 20. A place of the lake of fire. Hell gets chucked into that, we saw before, Revelation 20. A place of eternal fire, never stops, Matthew 18. A place of unquenchable fire, Mark chapter 9. A place of everlasting punishment, Matthew 25. A place of eternal condemnation, Mark chapter 3. And it's a place of eternal judgment. It's a place of everlasting destruction 2 Thessalonians 1 a place of weeping and nursing of teeth why why didn't I listen why did I let my pride send me to hell why couldn't I walk the aisle and say yes Jesus please forgive me. weeping and gnashing of teeth is a place of torment and it's a place of eternal torment it never ever 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 ends wow well, so I'm kind of thinking I don't know maybe it's just me if you're going to be honest with the Bible and the words of Jesus um Hell is the last place you'd ever want to go. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Okay? Now, here's the point. Listen, listen. You go, wow, why, why is the Bible so graphic about this? Are you kidding me? This is the, think about this. This is the greatest message of love. Listen, is it any wonder that Jesus talked twice as much about hell than he ever did about heaven? No. I believe that any sane person who loved other people, if that place was real, they'd love them enough to warn them about that place, not keep their mouth shut. In fact, if you did keep your mouth shut, how loving is that? And you knew better. But because Jesus loves us, he warned about it over and over and over and over again. But here lies the problem. Even though Jesus in the Bible is very replete, that there really is a hell and you really don't want to go there and he's trying to warn you out of love. You don't have to. But you're going to if you reject his mercy and grace and forgiveness. Even though it's pretty clear, people still today in our society refuse to believe in this place. Is there really a hell? Yes, there is, and you don't want to go there. But here's the good news. You, you don't have to. Even today, you don't have to. You can accept the sacrifice and the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, my behalf, on the cross, and he'll forgive you of everything you've ever done, past, present, future, and he'll take you to the complete antithesis of that. He'll take you to heaven. But if you reject it, then you sent yourself to hell. You had the way out, but you rejected it, okay? But that's not all. It gets even worse. You see, it's one thing for the world uh, to deny the existence of hell. I, I kind of expect that. I remember as a non-Christian, don't you talk about hell. Don't you call me a sinner. Those were fighting words, man. Nobody wants to believe uh, as a non-Christian uh, in the existence uh, of a hell. I understand that. But listen, here's what's horrible. This is, what, this is what gets me. The church today is denying the existence of hell. Now, if you were here at the first study, we saw, according to the stat, those who are professing to be Christians, about half of the American church right now denies the existence of hell. Can you believe that? About half the church is denying the existence of hell, even though the Bible clearly says it is. And this is what's wrong. How, how, how I'll use this word, how sick, how, 
how sick it is for people who know that there is a hell, it's clear in the Bible, Christian, yet unlike Jesus, you refuse to warn people of going there. That doesn't compute. Even in atheists, they know better. One said this about uh, Christians. Listen, this, this, is co- this is straightforward common sense logic. He said, listen, he said, an atheist said this. He said, if I believe what you Christians say you believe about, listen, about a coming judgment and that rejectors of Christ are going to be lost eternally in hell, listen, then I would crawl on my bare knees on crushed glass all over the city warning men night and day to flee from the wrath of God. Right? We would take uh, uh, witnessing a little bit more serious. I'll translate that for you. We wouldn't be so casual about it. You have to spell it out, Christian. You say, yes, you need to get saved, all right. You need to get saved from hell. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He took the death penalty in your place. You need to get saved from hell. You need to be rescued from that place. Won't you receive Jesus today? Hey, that's, that's a very loving thing, I think. Okay? Jesus doesn't lie. But because he loves us, he loves us enough to tell us the truth. Think about how slick the enemy is, guys. He's got half the church. We're the only ones who have this knowledge. That Praise God, we could be rescued from hell. And yet he is so convinced and infiltrated the church that half the church flat out denies the existence of hell. And then the rest of us play these games sometimes and we're ashamed of the H word. How did that ever become unloving? I'll say it again, folks. And I'm following the pattern of Jesus. If you refuse, Christian, to tell somebody about hell, do you really love that person? I mean, isn't that what Jesus did? I mean, mean, did he not love us enough to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That yes, there is a heaven and you can go. But there is a hell and you don't want to go there. And then then think about this. I mean, isn't this what Sunday should really be about? I mean, the core issue, whenever we meet as Christians, isn't this what it should be about? That we celebrate the fact, listen, that yes, praise God, Jesus Christ came to forgive us of all of our sins. But because we're forgiven of our sins, he came to rescue us from hell. I don't care. It is well with my soul. I don't care how bad you got it on planet Earth. God's never promised his rose garden. But man, just the one biblical truth, I'm not going to hell. Isn't that enough to keep a smile on your face till we get to heaven? It's a privilege to tell people about eternity. It's a privilege to tell them not just about heaven, but how they can be rescued 100% for sure from this place called heaven. Hell. It's the greatest news of all. It's the greatest gift of all. We should not be ashamed. And so in closing, I ask you here today, I don't know the heart, only God does. Have you truly received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not when, but when you die, are you sure right now that you really are headed to heaven? Or are you going to wake up too late like those guys? And then forever in torment go, why, why, why didn't I listen and respond? You can scoff all you want, folks, but one minute into eternity, all of us will discover that all the Bible is true and that Jesus doesn't lie. If you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. This guy almost learned the hard way. We'll close a prayer after this. As the uh, medical attendants began to work on me, I could hear their voices. And I could hear them saying, we can't help him. He'll have to be transported to another hospital. Probably will lose the arm. And as they loaded me into an ambulance, my wife had arrived by that time and got in the ambulance with me. But as they pulled out of the parking lot of that hospital, a young paramedic looked down into my face and I could barely see him. I was so weak. But he said, Sir, you need Jesus Christ. And I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know what he was talking about. So my reaction to that was to begin cursing. And uh, again, he stated to me, you need Jesus. 
And as he was talking to me, it, it appeared like the ambulance literally exploded in flames. I, I thought it had actually blown up. It filled with smoke. And immediately I was moving through that smoke as if through a tunnel. And after some period of time coming out of the smoke and out of the darkness, I began to hear the voices of a multitude of people screaming and groaning and crying. But as I looked down, the sensation was looking down upon a, a, a volcanic opening and seeing fire and smoke and, and people inside of this burning place screaming and crying. They were burning, but they weren't burning up. They weren't being consumed. But, but the most terrible part of it, I began to recognize many of the people that I was seeing in these flames as if a close-up lens on a camera was bringing their faces close to me. I could, I could see their features and see the agony and the pain and the frustration. And a number of them began to call my name and said, Ronnie, don't come to this place. There's no way out. There's no escape. If you come here, there's no way out. And I looked into the faces of, of one that had died in a robbery attempt who had been shot to death and bled to death on the sidewalk. And I looked in the face of two others that had died drunk in an automobile accident. And I looked into the face of others that had died of drug overdoses that we had partied together and, and the agony and the pain. But I believe the most painful part of it was the loneliness. And the depression was so heavy that there was no hope, there was no escape, there was no way out of this place. And the smell was like uh, sulfur, like an electric welder. And the, the stench was, was terrible. And as I looked at this, I had seen people killed. I had been involved in fights where people were killed. I've done time in prison for manslaughter myself. I grew up basically in a reform school and in a jail cell. I was beat on mercifully as a child by a father that had temper problems and alcohol problems. I was a runaway at 12 years old and I felt like there was nothing in this world that could frighten me. My life was wrecked, my marriage was wrecked, my health was wrecked, but now I'm seeing something that literally scares me to death because I don't understand it. And as I'm looking into this, this pit, this place of fire and screams and, and torment, I just fade out into blackness. And when I open my eyes, I'm in a hospital room in Knoxville, Tennessee, and through the days to come, I tried every way to get that out of my mind. I tried to get drunk. I could not get drunk. I tried to get stoned. I could not get stoned. I tried everything that I could to get this off my mind and I could not. And a couple of weeks later on a Sunday morning, a matter of fact, the date was November the 2nd, 1972. Just before 12 o'clock a.m., a minister stood to, to read from the Bible. I was sitting in the back of the building. I didn't know anything out of the Bible. I did not know how to act in church. But the minister stood to read from the Bible. And he read from the Gospel of John. And he began to read these words that said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of of the world. I started down the aisle toward the front of that building and my prayer was this. I didn't know the sinner's prayer. I didn't know the Roman road of salvation. But my prayer was this. God if you exist and Jesus if you are God's Lamb, please, please kill me. 
or cure me. I don't want to live anymore. I'm not a husband. I'm not a father. I'm no good. And at that instant, it was like the darkness and the blackness left my life. And the tears began to flow. And for the first time since I was nine years old, the tears did run. And the guilt left my life. And the violence and the anger and the hatred left my life. And Jesus Christ became Lord and Savior of my life that morning. And since that time, I didn't know what would happen, but God healed my mind, my memory. The drug addiction, the alcoholism was instantaneously gone, delivered. And from that moment, I knew that I had to tell the story of what had happened to me. My life was only spared to tell others about the place that I had seen and the hope of Jesus Christ to save mankind from this terrible fate. Throughout the ages, poets and writers voiced their own interpretations of the teachings of Jesus and what the biblical authors had written of heaven and hell. One particular story related by Jesus himself was of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen. And there was a beggar named Lazarus who laid at his gate full of sores and desired it so to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. man fared sumptuously every day, feasting and dining to his delight. But it came to pass that he too died and awoke in Hades. While in torment, he looked up and saw Lazarus and Abraham afar off. Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus to, to this vicar in water and cool my tongue. I am in agony in this fire. My friend, remember that while you lived, you had everything good and Lazarus everything bad. Now he is at peace, and it's you who are in pain. And besides, there's this great chasm between us that no one can cross over. Abraham, please send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. Do not let them come to this terrible place. Your brothers can read what Moses and the prophets wrote. 
That's what they should pay attention to. It's, it's not enough. If someone from the dead were to go to them and tell them, they would turn to God. If they won't pay attention to Moses and the prophets, they won't even listen to someone who comes back from the dead. The Bible says, if we claim we have not sinned, we are lying and calling God a liar, for He says we have sinned. We go through life searching for fulfillment. Because of our sin nature and the choices we make, we are separated from God and ultimate fulfillment. We are on one side of a great chasm and God is on the other. From our perspective, it seems there are many ways we can get to God. But in reality, our attempts to find God using philosophy, religion, psychology, New Age spirituality, or being a good person will never work. The gap is too great, and all these efforts fall short every time. The Bible says there is a penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The only answer, the only bridge between God and man, the only path to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Many choose this path and find eternal life. Others stubbornly choose their own way and consequently end up in the lake of fire. God has always had a plan to qualify us for heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was the only perfect, sinless man to ever live. The reason Jesus came to earth was to pay the price for each of our sins, to die for me and for you. He took the death penalty that we deserved upon himself. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. That means Jesus died for every one of my sins and every one of your sins. The wages of sin is death, and he paid that price. God's justice was carried out. With Jesus' last breath, he said, It is finished. But according to the Bible, that's only half the story. It gets better. To prove once and for all Jesus was the Son of God, Three days after his body was placed in a tomb, God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection is the most well-documented miracle in history. Legal experts tell us that the evidence for the resurrection would stand up in a court of law today. After he was crucified in front of hundreds of people, over a 40-day period, Jesus appeared to over 500 eyewitnesses. This was no ghost. They talked with him. They ate with him. They touched him. Those who hated and murdered him could never refute this historical fact. Think about this. The difference between Jesus and every other religion is this. Jesus said, I am the Son of God, and proved it by rising from the dead. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The path to eternal life is narrow and few find it, but the road to destruction is wide. It seems Jesus knew that few would believe he is the Son of God. Few would understand he is the only bridge to heaven. He knew many people would try other routes to heaven that only end in destruction. At least now you know the truth. You are aware of God's plan to get you to heaven. You are also aware of the plight of men and women. The Bible says God gave you a soul. You will live for eternity. The question is, where will you live? In heaven with God, your creator, or in hell with the devil and those demons we heard about earlier? 
Remember, the same 80% of Americans who believe there is a heaven also believe there is a hell. The Bible describes heaven as a place where there is no pain, no tears, just pleasure and what the Bible calls joy unspeakable. On the other hand, those who go to hell will be thrown into a lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. An eternity in hell means total darkness, excruciating pain, absolute loneliness all the time, without even a glimmer of hope. Amazingly, God gives you the ability to choose your destiny. No one can make that decision for you. But make no mistake, there are eternal consequences. It is by far the most important decision you will ever make. The Bible makes entrance into heaven very simple. Either you believe Jesus was the Son of God, or you deny it. It's black or white. As you can see here, there's no gray area, no neutral ground. If you think he was a wise teacher but not the Son of God, you're denying Jesus. If you think he was a great prophet but didn't really rise from the dead, you are denying Jesus. So where do you stand? Do you believe? Before you answer that, you need to be absolutely clear on what true belief is. The Bible calls it faith. Belief is saying yes with your mind. Faith is saying yes with your life. Nodding your head about Jesus is not what we're talking about here. A great illustration of the difference between belief and faith happened a number of years ago. James Blondin, a professional tightrope walker, strung a cable across the Niagara Falls. 25,000 people watched him carry his manager across the falls several times. He then asked his audience if they believed that he could do it again. They all said yes. But when he asked for volunteers to be carried across on his back, no one volunteered. They believed he could do it with someone else. But when it came to trusting him with their life, they had no faith in Blondin. Having faith, trusting Jesus with your life, is a lot bigger decision than just believing the historical facts about him. It's putting your life in his hands. Jesus says he will carry you through the tough times all the way to heaven. If you will just put your trust in him. To trust him, you have to repent of your old ways and have faith in Jesus as your new way. When you repent, it means you admit you're a sinner, a mistake maker like the rest of mankind, and you desire to turn away from your sins and go a new exciting direction. To have faith means right now, to the best of your ability, you sincerely believe Jesus is the Son of God and you trust His death on the cross and not any goodness of your own as your way to heaven. You gain interest to heaven when you repent and trust in Jesus. This video has brought you face to face with the real Jesus as portrayed in the Bible. More than a prophet or a great teacher, Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe He died for you? Whenever Jesus called His disciples in the Bible, He simply said, follow me. Today, you can make the same decision they made over 1,900 years ago. To trust Jesus and begin your walk with Him, simply pray a prayer of repentance. Ask God for His forgiveness. You can pray this prayer with the person who gave you this video. Pray it later by yourself, or you can pray it with us right now. Lord, I just pray, God, that you help me. There's no certain words you must use to pray a prayer of repentance and forgiveness. You just have to be sincere when you do it. Let's pray. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, God. I want to turn around and follow you. I want to turn around and follow you. Instead of following my own selfish ways. Instead of following my own selfish ways. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I realize now that you saved me from the punishment of my sins. I realize now that you saved me from the punishment of my sins. And made it possible for me to go to heaven. And made it possible for me to go to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. When you ask, Jesus will answer. The Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When you pray your first sincere prayer of repentance, you have acted on your faith. 
And God says, you are forgiven. Your slate is wiped clean. At the point you trust in Jesus Christ and seek him by faith, you spiritually cross over the bridge from death to life. You are reborn spiritually.